Hi everybody, another video. As always, thank you to everybody for supporting my work. Go over to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Eric Dreitzer. That's where you can find all of my videos and my writings and everything else, both those that are freely available and of course those that are only available to subscribers. Those of you who are already supporting, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this work takes time, it takes effort, and I really appreciate those of you who have um, well, stuck around and um, hopefully learned a few things and hopefully value this uh, contributions that I'm trying to make here because the situation with Ukraine, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and everything that's happened since then has, in my view, I, I can't really think of another uh, situation globally, at least in my lifetime, that has been so difficult to parse through what is true, what is not. Uh, maybe that's something about you know the nature of our post-truth hell world that we live in maybe this is something about the nature of how the internet and uh, social media have sort of fragmented the way that people view events around the world uh maybe it's about echo chambers or maybe it's because this this conflict is actually extremely complicated which it is in some ways and not in other ways um, but the point here is and i'm not trying to do a whole soliloquy on the complexities of this war it is simply to say that there is a tremendous amount of misinformation and disinformation and we have to be aware of how that misinformation and disinformation operates and to what end and i would say that there are a number of areas of this conflict where we've seen so much misinformation and disinformation and maybe no area more so than the question of the so-called donetsk and lugansk people's republics the so-called um you know people's militias the what, what happened in 2014 how the conflict emerges there and most importantly and maybe, maybe most in particularly the political character of donetsk and lugansk and what happened in 2014 how do we understand this there's so much propaganda if you swallow the uh you know the um the the nato european propaganda line on everything that's happened in 2014, then you are missing a huge portion of what really happened. Similarly, if you are regurgitating the Kremlin's talking points about everything that happened in 2014 and moving forward into today, then you know nothing about what's happening in the eastern part of Ukraine, in Donetsk and Lugansk. You probably, if you are still doing that in 2022, you probably are cynical and deliberately ignorant of the reality because only a truly cynical and or ignorant person could continue to peddle that same line that was being peddled in 2014. I'm not name calling. I put myself in the same category with everyone else who didn't fully appreciate the complexities in 2014. When I used to get invited onto RT back before, long before they blacklisted me, uh, when I used to get invited on RT and I used to talk about these things at the time when they were happening, I thought I understood the conflict. I thought I was contributing to helping people to understand something that was being concealed by the uh, mainstream discourse in the West, only to then find that I was, in fact, also parroting the Kremlin's talking points on what was happening there. So I was correct to reject the United States and, and, and NATO uh, narrative on all things in Ukraine, but obviously incorrect in being somebody who amplified a lot of disinformation from the Kremlin. It took a while to really understand that, to uh, look into the mirror and to realize that I had done that, uh, to be honest with myself and to understand that, uh, you know, I made mistakes. I tried to correct those. I tried to learn more. I tried to talk to people from the region. I tried to read analysis of what was happening. I tried to follow the money, investigate what I thought I understood. And it turns out there was a lot that I was correct about, but a lot, a tremendous amount that I was dead wrong about. Okay. Now, why do I bring all of that up? Because I believe that now, as we are into uh, you know the, the next stage of Russia's war on Ukraine, I think it's really important that we do our best to try to 
be honest and forthright about what's happened and to try to uh, figure out exactly how we should understand those regions and how they relate to Ukraine, to Russia, and how they relate to the chronology of events. So let's talk about that. But I'm going to do it using the, you know, through the prism of a kind of a, you know, for those of us in, you know, in the United States or whatever, you know, a where are they now segment, you know, we always saw these where are they nows of some celebrity that you hadn't thought of in 30 years. And what are they doing now? Well, where are they now applied to the leaders of the so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics? Okay, so as we all know, and I will just very briefly summarize, in 2014 with the, um, you know, well, with the Maidan protest, the Euromaidan, and then later the uh, conflict that ultimately was fomented in Donetsk and Lugansk, I'll get to that in a minute, um, we had a whole crop of leaders emerge in Donetsk and Lugansk, right? These were allegedly, you know, the leaders that were part of the uprising against a tyrannical Nazi government installed by the United States through its coup, uh, Victoria Newland, and all the rest of it. Okay, let's talk about who these people were, some of whom still actually have some relevance today. So all of the leaders, all of the leaders, at the early stages in 2014, all of the leaders that emerged, they are all out of the picture. They are either dead, they are in jail, or they are living in obscurity, far removed from anything resembling political power. This is true for almost all of them. I'll get to a couple that are still kind of closer to power, but that's a separate discussion. So the, it's, I guess it's important to say this at the outset. As I go through these individuals and their histories, these are the people that created the so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. As I go through this, what you're going to find is that there is an overarching narrative here, or maybe we could say an overarching conclusion that I would like to set out from the very beginning. The, the so-called Donetsk People's Republic, the DPR, and the Lugansk People's Republic, the LPR, these have never been legitimate. They were never people's republics. They are. They had no legitimacy in 2014, and they have even less legitimacy now. I'm not suggesting that there weren't people living in those regions that had uh, animosity towards Kiev. Of course, they did. The conflict was rooted in all kinds of very real issues. But the reality is that those so-called people's republics were, at the very outset, and especially since then, creations of the Russians. And let's talk about how this, how this worked. Okay. Not a conspiracy theory, documented facts. Let's look at it. And I will, I will uh, link to the article that I was pulling a lot of this information from. Thankfully, other researchers have done the work for me, so I didn't have to go back, but I did do a video on Donetsk and Lugansk many months ago at the early stages of the war, probably March of 2022. You can go back and find that video, find it on the Patreon or on the YouTube channel. I, I don't know where it is. All right. The first individual we need to discuss here is uh, probably one of the most well-known, uh, certainly for those of us who have been following this since 2014, and especially for those of us who had uh, uh, positive feelings in 2014 towards a people's republic. Pavel Gubaryov, Gubarev is how you, is how you uh, spell it, Gubaryov. Uh, he was a petty business owner very minor figure uh, with connections to the Party of Regions. Now, I guess I'll just say the Party of Regions was the party of uh, the deposed president, Viktor Yanukovych. This was a party that was especially strong in uh, the east of Ukraine. It had, among many other characteristics, an extremely pro-Russian attitude. And in fact, there were several pro-Russian Ukrainian oligarchs that were connected to the Party of Regions, Yanukovych only being one of those uh, figures. So in any event, uh, the Party of Regions, along with the Communist Party of Ukraine, which should really be understood as essentially two wings of the same ruling clique, um, those, two, those two parties were essentially dominant in the East. Now, 
Pavel Gubaryov, as a young man, joined a Russian nationalist movement that really shouldn't be called Russian nationalist exactly. It really was a far-right neo-Nazi organization called the Russian National Unity, the RNE or the RNU, depending on which acronym and which language you want to use. Uh, this was, like I said, uh, a neo-Nazi organization. Um, there were splits within the organization. Some were slightly less Nazi than others, but they were all fascist okay and their basic worldview was a a national socialist russian imperial worldview okay and that's of course going to become relevant here in a few minutes um he went to the training camps that were organized by the Russian uh, Russian National Unity Movement. So these were little Nazi training camps that they set up for, you know, the various youth wings of these organizations. And it's going to be relevant here in a minute. By 2014, Gubaryov is back in Donetsk, and he is a leader that emerges during these rallies, these anti anti Maidan rallies, which had some legitimacy in the sense that there were people that were genuinely anti Maidan that were against the uh, you know some of the uh, uh, demands that were being made by protesters in Kiev, and certainly were against the political formations that had their bases in the west of Ukraine. So. Um, in any event, the anti-Maidan rallies were to a large degree organized by people like Gubaryov, and um, he was involved in organizing these rallies, in seizing government buildings. If we remember the occupation of certain government buildings in Donetsk, that was Gubaryov, and eventually he's elected people's governor. He, and this is really critical, this is where we really need to pay close attention. Gubaryov is directly connected to Konstantin Malafeyev. Now, Malafeyev is an, a Russian oligarch and financier who was directly connected with funding many of these public-private operations that the Russians had been launching. And uh, Malafeyev, interestingly, is the funder for Alexander Dugin, who's going to make an appearance here in a few minutes. Uh, so Malafeyev was financing Igor Strelkov Girkin. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because he himself became governor in Donetsk pre, uh, uh, you know, for a time. He is well known as a right-wing ultra-nationalist voice within the Russian blogosphere, somebody who has basically called for expanding the war, criticizing Putin from his right, criticizing the military for failing, etc. Girkin uh, or Strelkov, as he calls himself, uh, this is somebody who is a proxy of the Kremlin, okay, and a proxy of Konstantin Malafeyev. Malafeyev was the one distributing the money. He was funding not only Dugin's networks, both those in terms of their websites and their think tanks and all of the rest of it. He was also funding the Eurasian, uh, the Eurasian movement, the Eurasian youth movement, the Eurasian movement broadly, which is part of the way that fighters were recruited to create the militias in Donetsk and Lugansk. This is all documented. It's been documented in a number of peer-reviewed research papers. I can reference them in the links uh, with this video. Okay, so Gubaryov is connected to Malafeyev. His wife, a woman named Yekaterina, she has uh, uh, in 2014 met with fighters prior to the Battle of Slavyansk. Ultimately, uh, Pavel Gubarov is arrested and eventually is part of a prisoner exchange that is conducted by uh, Strelkov or Girkin himself, and he's exchanged for uh, several members of Ukrainian special forces that had been captured. So obviously someone of importance if you're exchanging him for captured Ukrainian special forces operators. He's eventually, um, he's eventually then the creator of what becomes called the Free Donbass Movement in October. October of 2014, which briefly also claimed power in Donetsk. Okay, so a political operator who is more or less at the at the very leading edge of this uh, uprising in Donetsk. Okay, now what happens to him is kind of a pattern that you see emerge. He's a loudmouth. He's criticizing openly some of the uh, authorities that were put in place by Moscow, and ultimately was disliked by everyone 
who eventually was in power, especially by the ultimate leader of uh, Donetsk, uh, a guy named Alexander Zakharchenko, who conveniently dies in 2018 and is supplanted by the current leader, a guy named Denis Pushilin. So Pushilin goes through a power struggle. By the way, uh, you know, unknown assailants attempted to assassinate Gubaryov. Uh, interestingly, timed what timing of all of this as Pushilin takes over. Eventually, Gubaryov is forced out of Donbass completely, and the Free Donbass Party that he created is just taken over by Denis Pushilin. So Pushilin, who's currently in charge, has basically simply consolidated power against all of the other uh, individuals that had risen up to, uh, you know, become leaders of Donbass or Donetsk specifically. It's very interesting that what happens by 2022 then, after Gubaryov has been forced out, after all of this has happened, 2022, Russia, you know, invades or reinvades, depending on what, you know, how you want to call what happened in 2014. Uh, and uh, Gubaryov is now given basically a second chance. He goes, allegedly goes to the front to fight. His wife, Yekaterina, resurfaces in Kherson as a member of the Russian occupation of Kherson, the, the uh, occupation administration in Kherson. And allegedly that she was involved in uh, social services, but specifically she was involved in handling money, humanitarian aid and other aid that was supposed to go into Ukraine from Russia. Interestingly and unsurprisingly, once it all becomes very uh, inconvenient for the authorities, the Russians abandoning Kherson and guess what? Yekaterina is arrested and charged with embezzling 60 million rubles in funds. Okay, so no surprise here. The people that are the people that become inconvenient for the Kremlin, they get sidelined. So Gubaryov, how do we understand him? This is what you need to know about Donetsk and Lugansk, this private public, you know, private slash state intelligence operation with these partnerships where you have an oligarch and a military or intelligence operator, Malafeyev paying Girkin, Girkin being his military man, these guys using somebody like Gubaryov, okay, with the far right politics and everything else that comes with that. Malafeyev himself is a, an adherent of far right fascist politics, very much a Duganist uh, himself. So the Gubaryovs, interestingly, they had no real connections from what from from the reports, no real connections to the United Russia Party, no real connections to any major players in uh, inside of Russia, with the exception of Malafeyev himself. And this is part of the reason why they get sidelined. The Russians, Putin and his people, they don't like unpredictable, loudmouth, ideologically driven shitheads like Gubaryov. They don't want people that they can't control, who have ideas about things, who actually think uh, uh, that these things matter, right? They want cynical political operators, administrators, system guys, right? Gubaryov was not a system guy. Pushilin is a system guy. That's why he's in charge. That's why Gubaryov is a nobody today. All right, let's talk about another one, Andre Purgin. By the way, these names are very familiar to those of us who have been following this from, from the beginning. Uh, but if they're not, then there's plenty of information that you can look up on these folks. Andre Purgin founded the Donetsk Republic all the way back in 2005. Okay, so this is an important dynamic to understand with regard to Ukrainian politics as well. In 2004, the so-called Orange Revolution, which the Russians call a color revolution, the Orange Revolution, uh, which brings into power Yushchenko, Yushchenko, who was more aligned with European interests than he was with Russian interests. This then leads to the very first uh, seeds of what you would call Donetsk separatism, right? It is in response to Yushchenko, you know, and his pro-European government that you have this guy Purgin establishing the Donetsk Republic in 2005. So this is, uh, again, this is a party or rather, this is a, a, a movement, I guess you could say, that is specifically patronized and supported by the Party of Regents with handlers in Moscow. Again, there, uh, the Party of Regents is a political party, but it's also a political operation, right? It's not just a party that runs candidates. It's also, you know, these... Uh, um, uh, 
patronage networks and uh, financial flows and all kinds of other things involved. Okay, so the um, the Donetsk Republic activists were trained in the Eurasian movement created and led by Alexander Dugin. Okay, and this is where the money came from. So if you think so for those for those people who claim to be on the left, who claim that people like me talking about Dugan are just lying and making everything up. No. Go and look at the real information. Don't for, forget the nonsense that comes from these fake ass fake anti-war liars. Go to the real information. Look at the documented history, the documented evidence of all of this, and you're going to find. That in fact, that Eurasian movement that Dugan created was the training ground for a lot of these people that ultimately became the so-called people's militias. Okay, Pergen is only one example of that. Okay, so they're trained in Dugan's camps. They get money from Dugan's networks, which are financed by Malafeyev. And then by 2012, again, we're talking still a year, two years before what uh, what ultimately happened in, in 2013, 2014. Already in 2012, Pergen is distributing uh, passports for the so-called Donetsk Republic. Okay, so the, why I'm bringing this up, the concept of, a, of Donetsk separatism goes back all the way back to 2005. And in fact, one could say that the groundwork is laid for all of that in the events that followed the 2004 rise of Yushchenko. Okay, so uh, Purgin becomes the first head of the Donetsk uh, parliament, but as with Gubaryov, he's gradually removed from anything resembling political power or political influence. Eventually, Purgin, just like many others, ends up jailed. He ends up in one of these local basements, and I, I, I'm quoting basement there because it's well understood and well documented uh, by a number of organizations. I don't have it all in front of me right now, but that part of the way that um, let's call it justice is meted out in Donetsk and Lugansk is through these torture basements, basically, where people that are, uh, for various reasons, fallen out of favor or have run afoul of somebody in the administration or whatever, they're just chained up in these basements, beaten, tortured. Sometimes they come out, sometimes they don't. Many of them just disappear into these basements. Okay, so anyway, Perkin ends up in one of the in, in one of these basements, and eventually, um, he, you know, more or less becomes irrelevant. Okay, so in September of 2015. Uh, Purgin is dismissed as the head of the Donetsk People's Council in favor of Pushilin. He's then arrested. His supporters, this is interesting, his supporters claim that he was targeted because he was against the Minsk agreements. Remember, the Minsk agreements were those uh, proposals that would have reincorporated uh, Donetsk and Lugansk into Ukraine in exchange for many of the demand for the demands that Russia had at the time. I'm not going to get into all of the details of Minsk. Um, probably another time, another video for that. Okay, so um, apparently he was against the Minsk agreements and was really ideologically driven. Again, a big no no for the Russian authorities. He tries to create then a legal opposition within Donetsk called the Republican Movement of Donbass in order to try to challenge his rival Pushilin. Of course, this is not authorized by the authorities. It is not allowed. He's then accused by the local press, conveniently, of being a secret agent for the Ukrainian intelligence services. And that's that for Pergen. Again, somebody who was central to creating the entire concept of a Donetsk People's Republic, gone, irrelevant. How about separatist historian and journalist named Roman Manekin? Manekin. 2017, he tries to publish information about Russian citizens who had been in the militias. Again, not what you're told by the Putin cheerleader camp, right? Supposedly, these were homegrown militias. These are people from Donetsk and Lugansk who are sick and tired of oppression from the Nazis in Kiev and simply took up arms to fight against the, their oppressive government. Great. No problem, right? Wrong. Okay. These were Russians to a large degree. Many of the so-called volunteers were Russians. They were caught there. This is well known. They were recruited by Dugan and Dugan's people. This is also well known. Again, the Eurasian the Eurasian movement was a breeding ground for precisely these kind of 
far right fanatical separatists. Okay, uh, so anyway, he tries to publish uh, information about these volunteers that are arrested in Donetsk. He's detained, tortured by the MGB, which is basically the Donetsk KGB, and uh, his his health is ruined. In 2020, he's arrested again. He is uh, charged with criticizing Pushilin, arrested as a Ukrainian spy, and released just last month. Good for him. How about Dmitry Trepeznikov, former deputy to Alexander Zakarchenko, functionary under uh, uh, the oligarch Akhmetov under his football team prior to his political activity. Zakarchenko's death then leads to the power struggle with Puchilin and uh, Trepeznikov ultimately leaves Donetsk. I'm going quickly because I don't want to spend an hour talking about each of these people. Um, but again, you get the idea. Uh, Trapeznikov ends up leaving Donetsk, going into Russia, trying to uh, get some political position in Russia. Failure. Alexander Timofeyev, interesting, D- uh, Donetsk economic advisor, involved in very, very, very shady schemes that I've talked about in prior videos, just one of the many involves these uh, this massive money laundering operation through these companies, uh, holding companies in South Ossetia, like Vnesh Torg Service, which is uh, basically this uh, clearinghouse for funneling millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars of wealth out of Donetsk and Lugansk and sending it directly into the pockets of oligarchs in Russia who control this operation. Okay, Timofeyev is one of the people who helped set up the financial side of all of this, the financial architecture. Eventually, as with almost all of these figures, he eventually ends up in prison three and a half years for an extortion scheme that he was involved in. No surprise there how that played out. Again, this common theme of these guys falling out of favor and then either being killed or being uh, jailed or being tortured or some combination thereof, this is again, this is how Putin and the Russians operate. Now, those that came out of the party of regions that ultimately have been successful were primarily political operators, cops, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, leadership within the uh, police and so forth. Thugs, basically, you know, uh, thugs in suits. The party of regions basically tried to copy the Putin United Russia model. They basically tried to create a total political monopoly in Ukraine. That's what the whole challenge of 2004 and then eventually the reinstallation of Yanukovych years later. That's what this is really about. The party of regions trying to recreate a United Russia style scenario in Ukraine where they could essentially crowd out all political opposition. And in fact, the party of regions has an its adjunct the communist party of ukraine both of which were understood to be basically one operation largely controlled by the russians okay so the party of regions basically tries to import the russian social management style with its all vertical authority and everything else and uh basically to create the political monopoly this is part of what was being pushed back against during the maidan was the idea that the that these parties in the east were basically going to be able to dictate the entire politics of ukraine that's what they wanted but ukraine isn't russia more complicated and they obviously failed in that in that uh, attempt. Now, let's look at who's leading the security agencies right now. You have a guy in uh, in the Donetsk Republic known uh, as Leonid Pasechnik. He's a former SBU officer that is Ukrainian intelligence uh, who ends up heading the Lugansk Republic. He's now the uh, he's now one of the main people involved for the on behalf of the Russians. His minister of internal affairs is a guy, a former police colonel named Alexei Diki. Now, this guy had been combating organized crime under the former interior minister, Arsene Avakov, but eventually he defects and uh, he defects and becomes you know, one of the main people in Donetsk. And even up until today, after Russia's annexation of Donetsk, he's now elevated to the rank of police general in Russia. How about Vladimir Pavlenko, uh, the Donetsk Ministry of State Security head, former KGB operative, former SBU operative, joined with Igor with Strelkov, Girkin, in 2014. He's remained in that post even after the annexation by Russia, which basically means, again, he's Putin's man. He's Russia's man. If you're left in that post after the annexation, that's because you work for them. 
Um, so interestingly, a uh, quote from journalist Dmitry Durnev, who says the MGB, that is the intelligence operation in uh, Donetsk, that they are a completely, cl- a quote, completely closed, independent body directly supervised from Moscow. In other words, the intelligence service in Donetsk has nothing to do with Donetsk. It's a Russian operation. It's controlled by the Kremlin. Okay. Moving on, Denis Miroshnichenko, Miroshnichenko, former Party of Regions youth activist. Uh, he's been the Speaker of, of the Parliament of Luhansk since 2017. Here's somebody that you want to know if you have an opinion about what happened in Odessa in 2014 and the so-called and the massacre, quote unquote, uh, in Odessa. Uh, interestingly, if you read the accounts of that, that begins with a brawl with a riot carried out, uh, according to the United Nations, begun by elements within the pro-Russia camp. Now, Miroshnichenko was involved in recruiting the football hooligans and the various others, the Nazis and so forth, that were anti-Maidan, that came to the protest on May 2nd with clubs and helmets ready to break up the pro-Maidan rally. That's what led to the fire and the killings. That's what led to the situation. It's not the other way around, the way the Kremlin tries to present it. Don't look at me. The United Nations and and a number of other watchdog organizations already published reports on the subject. Okay? Um, move Just very quickly, I got to finish because I am running out of time here. Uh, the Party of Regions and the Communist Party of Ukraine, these were political operations that were essentially designed to create a political system similar to what was happening in Russia. I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say designed. They were trying to do that. Okay. They were trying to clear the board of the political situation and essentially control the country themselves. And so this is part of the complex political dynamic that's totally ignored by the pro-Russia camp. There were dynamics already in place in Ukraine at the time where elements that were essentially proxies of the Russians that were trying to control the politics in Ukraine. This is part of the problem that people don't understand. Russia didn't simply invade. Russia had a political operation and an economic financial operation going in Ukraine going back years. Okay, and many of those figures that ultimately rise to become pro-Russian voices, they were being paid and directed by the Russians. This we know. There's no question about this anymore. I'm running out of time. I have like four missed calls in the time that I've been doing this. We have to I have to end it there. But please understand that the money laundering and the criminality and everything else that's been going on there, these are hell worlds. Donetsk and Lugansk. You do not want to be there. These are not people's republics. These are organized crime regions that are basically under the authority of the Russians. Don't look at me. You think I'm just some anti-Russian voice who just goes on and on about my hatred for Russia? No. Read the reports yourselves. Human rights reports. There's been UN reports. There's been many others that have documented what's happening over there. Stop swallowing Russia's talking points. Don't believe me. Don't believe NATO. Don't believe Biden or anybody else. Go read the reports yourself. And please do me a favor and stop talking shit if you don't know what you're talking about. Talk to you next time.